in this episode of Small Living. Benita Larsen returns to teach us how to better organize our wardrobes. We learn how to revive our plants when their health is failing with Jason from Plant Society. Celeste chats to Jack Chen, the architect behind the Type Street apartment, about designing a small home to better fit your needs. First up, creative florist Melanie of Cecilia Fox explores a different way to style your space. Hi, my name's Melanie and I'm a florist at Cecilia Fox in Melbourne, Australia. Today I'm going to make for you a table arrangement that you could use on your dining room table for a dinner party or just for a bit of fun. I'm going to fill these vases that I've got up with some water. I've got these really beautiful ceramics but you could use any, any vessel that you had at home. Drinking glasses, cups, bottles. So I'm going to start with my camellias. Um, I really love this beautiful, vibrant colour and the shape. It's a really nice big bloom. And for this particular arrangement, I'm going to take all of the leaves off so we can really showcase these really beautiful uh, flowers. And for woody flowers like camellias, it's a nice idea just to uh, cut <laughs> up the stem as well just so you can be sure that they're drinking really well. Arranging the flowers, I'm really trying to think about the different colors and shapes, but also about the negative space that's gonna be around each flower. Imagine that you're sitting at this um, beautiful set dining table. You don't wanna have anything that's too tall, but also you wanna have some really beautiful shapes. Really gorgeous tulips. These tulips I actually bought from the flower market they're probably four day, five days old now. Um, tulips, when they're cut, they grow about 10 centimetres in the vase, which is why some people think that they go droopy. But I really love these gorgeous shapes and it really is the beauty of them. So the other little trick that I'm going to show you with these tulips is just turning the petals out. Now this particular tulip will do this by itself um, naturally as it gets older. But for our dinner party, it'd be really nice if we can open them out like that. So I'm gonna save an extra couple of blooms of these camellias just to lay on the table. Um, I'm gonna use some of this yellow now. It's a really good idea when you're using Narcissi, which are daffodils or um, jonquils or anything like that, to put them in their own vase because they actually have a sap in them, which apparently kills other flowers. So it's a good idea. And I don't want to use too many of these because they've got a really strong fragrance. So I'm really looking at all of these beautiful shapes that we're creating here. The other thing that I've got are these really beautiful little kumquats. Um, the leaves are a little bit yellow, so I'm going to take most of these leaves off as well and I'm just gonna place them on the table as well in amongst. Um, I really love using fruit, laying them on the table and using them in your little story. These poppies are so gorgeous and they're just starting to open out now so by the time our dinner party starts, they'll be fully open. The other thing that you can do to get them to open is give them a little blow and these are just so gorgeous. And I'm gonna try and keep them as tall as I can because they've got such beautiful shapes. So I don't wanna take away from their beautiful form there. The other thing that's really gorgeous about poppies is when they're in their bud. A really, a really lovely little furry casing. What you can do as well with your poppies if you want them to open, you can peel, peel off their little outside casing, their lovely little furry jackets, and just really gently, they're almost like a little tissue. Give them a little blow. And in a couple of hours that, Poppy would have opened right out like this one. We've used 
uh, little vessels that are all different heights so we can get some interest and some movement. Think of it as creating a sculpture. You're using your table as a canvas, thinking about the negative space as well as the forms. It's also really beautiful to have these flowers that have so much movement. It's, I love it when their um, flowers lay their heads down on the table as well. My one piece of advice would be to be adventurous. There's no rights or wrongs. I really hope that I've inspired you today to create a beautiful tablescape for your dinner party tonight. My name is Benita Larsson. I'm from Stockholm, Sweden. I create videos for my namesake channel on minimalism, organization, and the Scandinavian lifestyle. When organizing your wardrobe, there are some things to consider. The material of your garments, the size of your wardrobe, and the amount of hanging space versus shelf and drawer space. I like to hang as much as I can for easier access, but you should primarily hang clothes that are prone to creasing like shirts and dressier garments. Pants that easily crease can also be hung on clip hangers. I even hang my medium and lightweight woolly sweaters during the fall and winter season. To me, hanging is an easier way to get dressed in the mornings and to keep my wardrobe organized. In the summer season, I fold my woolies so they don't stretch out unnecessarily while not being worn. Other items that fold well are tops and non-slippery materials like t-shirts. To fold, I lay my top on a surface face down. Then I fold in the sides and arms. And fold in half. For lightweight tops you can do one more fold, a file fold, which allows you to store them standing up in a drawer or a drawer insert. I also like to fold and stack jeans and pants. First I fold them lengthwise, back pockets on the outside. Then I grab the crotch and top of the waistband, shake and smooth everything out. Lastly, I fold into thirds, which makes them stack nicely. For drawers, I like to use these inserts from IKEA, and you can most likely find a combination that works for your drawer. I use them for socks, underwear, loungewear and workout clothes, and they also work perfectly for file-folded t-shirts. They also work well as drawers on shelves. I'm super anal and like to color coordinate all the things, including my wardrobe. So when I hang or fold, I go from light to dark for each type of clothing. When organizing, consider if you wear everything you have in your wardrobe. If not, do a bit of culling. Sell or donate items that you haven't worn in a year and items that are not the right size and shape for you. If space is still tight, consider moving seldom used pieces like seasonal sports gear and special occasion clothing to a different storage space if you have it. For more videos like this, visit my channel Benita Larsson, where I share all things Scandinavian from my apartment here in Stockholm and beyond. This episode of Small Living is sponsored by Raycon. Raycon makes really good earbuds. As people who are into small but beautifully designed things, they tick all the right boxes. We've been spending a lot of time on video calls, listening to podcasts and music at the moment, probably like you. And we've got to say Raycon's everyday E25 earbuds do a great job. They look good, but most importantly, they have six hours of playtime and easy Bluetooth pairing. If you're anything like us, you lose things all the time. But the everyday E25 earbuds come in a great little charging case, which keeps them right where we want them when we need them. So if you're on the lookout for a new pair of headphones, the Raycon earbuds start at about half the price of any other premium wireless earbuds on the market. So they're well worth a look. Thanks to Raycon, you can get 15% off your pair of everyday earbuds. Click on the link in the description. And thank you to Raycon for supporting Never Too Small and Small Living.
So as a gardener, it's completely okay to kill plants. And I tell people that all the time because we're dealing with the natural environment, which isn't always in our favor. Um, but when you do have a plant that's sick, um, there's ways to bring it back to life quite easily. If you do happen to kill a plant to the point where there's no return, use it as a lesson to teach you what went wrong and almost to not repeat it again. So a good example is a maidenhair fern. You might um, try it in a space that has low light and find that it dies. The next time you might try to grow it in a place that has brighter light. So if you do have a plant like this that is showing signs of life still, but obviously this part of the grass has died off, um, we simply wanna give it a good chance to come back. And um, grasses are quite hardy. Um, so it's good to remove all that dead foliage, like so. And by doing this, um, the train of thought is that it will put the energy back into the plant that will survive. Just trimming it all the way around. And we can trim a bit of the top off as well. And once we've done that, it's a good time to feed it with nutrients. So the rock dust are a slow release again. It's important not to liquid fertilize your plants. So when a plant is weak, you don't want to pressure it into really thriving because it won't, it will just send it into shock. So with plants, think about how humans would feel as well. So if a human is in shock, it's not a good time to um, stress them out even more by making them do something they don't want to. So plants are the same in terms of care. Um, and what they need. So we're just gonna give it some nutrients. Um, great um, use of seaweed um, is a great way to calm your plants down. So um, seaweed naturally just calms your plants down to the point where they can thrive again. So once I've done that, I give it a good water um, and then I can, in the next few months, hopefully it thrives and comes back. So in this instance, we've got a piece silly which is showing some signs of underwatering. So you can see the brown edges there. And what you wanna do is not be alarmed by that. You can see the plant's still healthy, but we want to remove the brown foliage. So you can either trim the whole leaf off, but in, in this instance, I'm gonna just trim the brown bit off because the majority of the leaf is still healthy. So we simply trim like so. And we'll do the same on this leaf as well. And this often occurs when um, you've gone on holiday or you've been busy at work. When you get home, you realize your piece silly is thirsty. Um, so it's no one's fault but being busy. Um, and this is a simple way of allowing your plants to bounce back. So always check underneath as well and trim off any brown leaves. You can see this leaf here is slightly yellow. Um, I personally trim it right off because once it goes yellow, it's not going to go green again. And it will put the energy into the rest of the plant. And once again, we're just for, um, giving it nutrients. Um, no fertilizer because it will go into shock. Um, and once it's relaxed is when we start feeding it again. So don't let your casualties really deter you from gardening. Um, use them as a lesson. Thanks for tuning in to learn more about greenery within your home. If you are after more information, head to our website. It's www.theplantsociety.com.au. Hi, my name's Celeste, and today I'm speaking with Jack Chen, the director of Melbourne-based architecture studio, Zai Design. Jack is driven by the challenge of making spaces work harder for their occupants, something beautifully echoed in Never Too Small's episode of The Type Street Apartment. Hi, Jack, how are you? Hi, Celeste, hi. <laughs> Good, yourself? Yeah, really well, thank you. Um, hey, I'd like to learn some more about your background. Uh, how long have you been working in architecture? It's coming to my 14th year. I started in um, New South Wales, um, practiced there uh, since 06. Um, yeah, and then um, last four years, I decided to transition to Melbourne. And did you set up your practice when you moved to Melbourne or was that something you began in Sydney? Thai design started as a, just a side hobby while I'm working full time. Um, so that was me playing with um, jewelry boxes, uh, light boxes, something to keep me interested on the side. Um, and it was only when yeah after I moved to Melbourne, um, 
decided to give it a go um, and it kind of started with um, around the same time as Type Street Apartment. How did you begin experimenting with small spaces? Um, actually, Type Street Apartment is my very first project uh, dealing with small spaces. So prior to that, all my experiences are um, up houses, pretty big houses. Now I'm taking on, yeah, probably 50% of my work are uh, small projects. Um, and yeah, which I thought is a good balance between uh, uh, being furniture, small houses, and um, yeah. And how do you approach the challenge of redesigning an underutilized space? First thing is definitely, uh, I guess the way I approach design is always finding, yeah, first thing is finding the problems. I, I feel like I'm more of a problem solver than, than designing something beautiful in, in underutilized space. Uh, first, first issue is coming up with, yeah, what, what you think is lacking and um, whether you need to start from a blank canvas or whether to work with the existing conditions. And I know that in the Type Street apartment, there's a very flexible living, dining and working zone. Tell us some more about how you could make a space multifunctional and, and also about the kind of furniture that you can put in these kinds of spaces to make them work harder. Yeah, with the Type Street, uh, it's about, I think, that dining table. Um, it actually is like a sliding door construction detail. Um, you need to choose which part is flexible quite carefully because for, for Type Street apartment, the occupant is myself. Um, I know I'm, I don't use that, uh, the dining table too much. And so you, you wouldn't want to you know, have that operation every single day. That would be too tough. And I guess that's stretched out to you know the general principle of in, you know Murphy bed is a typical solution you do for flexible living, but I wouldn't probably recommend that for for every single person. Going to bed is something should be quite relaxing just to de-stress. And the fact you need to fold and unfold and pack and re repack, uh, that just costs uh, tension. So flexible is a good idea, but you have to uh, be careful uh, where you insert it. What are some key considerations for people who may have a small space and might be thinking about um, maybe upgrading that? What kinds yeah. of things should they think about when, um, I guess, seeing uh, design solutions online and then maybe applying them to their homes? What are some key considerations when it comes to smaller spaces? Some things that are crucial in, um, in space design, even big or small, is about the the lighting, the daylight that comes through. So you have to pick, pick your uh, property carefully, finding one that has the opportunity to give you the amount of daylight, because I think that's crucial to give that, that um, the, the comfort you need in a space. And then, yeah, the last bit is probably just be careful about how much flexible furniture you apply to a space. So I know uh, Type Street does show off a few of these examples. Um, now having lived through the Type 3 apartment, um, if I was to do it again, some things will change. And so um, Type 3 is definitely not perfect. And uh, so my last few um, projects, I have um, treated um, small space very differently. So everything has its own place now versus everything overlapping each other. And what materials are you drawn to using in your projects? Yeah, I do use a lot of um, kind of uh, timber, something, something raw, something of um, that retains its natural look. Um, I'm also the first to admit that some of my product isn't all real wood and stuff. So like, you know, the, the timber tile in Type 3 apartment um, in the bathroom, you know, those are just porcelains and stuff like that. New technology these days, it blends your, um, yeah, it, it's so uh, advanced these days, it's hard to tell the real from fake. Um, for me, that's okay in terms of it gives you um, a visual cue to what the natural material are. I think besides the, the, the timber, which is kind of featured quite a lot in my uh, um, designs, um, I think, yeah, it's, it's the hints of the grain, so like the moss wall you mentioned. Um, how do you approach sustainability when designing uh, spaces and also uh, the furniture work that you do? I think sustainability for me um, is probably how the longevity of, of a project and how, how it can adapt through different stages So a project, five years, ten years, how it changes as the client's lifestyle changes and stuff like that. Some of the projects I'm taking on right now, I'm designing in you know two to three stages. So I'm giving them a, a five-year house and then uh, I 
in the same time I gave them after this five years uh, step what does stage two look like so you minimize you know uh, having to demolish the kitchen and restarting again you're reusing what we already started uh, so it's cost efficiency as well as you know the whole sustainability I think it's quite crucial wonderful well thank you so much for taking the time to speak to me today no problem thank you for having me cheers Next episode, we'll speak to Jean Graham, designer of the Torquay Compartment Apartment. Subscribe to the channel and click the bell to receive updates. And for more details from this episode, visit www.nevertosmall.com.